Welcome to the Elisa Childers podcast, where we equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And this discussion that I just had with Professor Nancy Piercy was so enlightening, and I'm so excited for you to get to listen to it. Uh, if you've listened to the podcast for any amount of time, you know I'm a huge fan of Professor Piercy. I love some of her books, like Love Thy Body. Her book, Saving Leonardo, is one of my favorites that I've ever read. Uh, but she's just come out with a new book. Well, actually, it is coming out on the 27th, I believe, of June, and it's called The Toxic War on Masculinity. Now, this is such an important book for our time and place in our culture because there's such a war, not just on masculinity, but on gender roles in general, right? About the distinctions between the sexes. And this book deals with so much of that. And some highlights for me in the conversation, one of the biggest highlights and something I actually didn't know is that contrary to the popular cultural narrative, conservative evangelical men, the data proves out that they actually have the lowest levels of abuse and divorce, right? We've all heard, oh, don't we all hear all the time that Christians have the same divorce rates as the rest of society? It's actually not true. Nancy's going to uh, parse that out for us in this conversation. Also loved learning about how the Darwinian theory of evolution normalized many traits in men that are labeled today as toxic. We talked about that. We talked about how men are actually falling behind in areas of education, employment, health, and even life expectancy even though in culture it seems like if you act like there's any kind of a war on men or boys, oh, you know, they'll just make fun of you and say, well, that's just silly because men have been at the top of the food chain and they're the oppressors and everybody else is the victim. So we talked through all of these things. Can't wait for you to listen to this. But before we get to that, I did want to address a question that came up in last week's live stream. So if you listened to the episode from last week, we talked through letters from a deconstructed son, and I took a question at the end live on YouTube, and I wanted to read from Jay Sklar's commentary about, which was just such a great answer to the question, and I couldn't pull it up in time, so I promised I would do that at the beginning of this podcast. So let me just quickly read to you the question that this uh, viewer had, and then I'll give a few thoughts, and then we'll get right into our conversation with Nancy Piercy. This question was from Robert, and it said, When Jesus taught forgiveness will end our sins, why need sacrifice? And then he quotes Jesus from Matthew 9, saying, If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. And so there is a little bit of confusion about this, because if we think about what the Old Testament sacrificial system actually accomplished, or what we think about in the relationship between sacrifice and forgiveness, the book of Leviticus actually has a lot to say about that. And so this Old Testament scholar, Jay Sklar, wrote a wonderful commentary on Leviticus. I really encourage you to pick it up. And so he points out that Leviticus really makes it clear that the sacrificial atonement leads to the sinner being forgiven, but then you have in Hebrews. Hebrews says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So how do we reconcile that? So really, what is Jesus talking about when he says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice? Well, if we go to what the sacrificial system actually accomplished in the Old Testament, I'm just going to, I'm going to read you this from Jay Sklar's commentary because it is so good. He says this, atoning sacrifice in the Old Testament may be compared to writing a check. Uh, the purpose of the check was to cover the debt of sin. The form of the check was an animal sacrifice whose lifeblood was given in place of the sinners. The Lord in his grace received the check and declared the debt paid, graciously assuring forgiveness to the offerer, but he did not cash it. In the grand scheme of things, it's not possible for the lifeblood of an animal to fully ransom the lifeblood of a human. To return to the analogy, the check would have to be, would have bounced, right? So, continues Sklar, why did the Lord receive it as a payment at the time? Because he knew that there would one day be money in the account to cover the debt. Namely, when Jesus gave his lifeblood as the perfect and final ransom for the lifeblood of sinners. And we read about this in Hebrews 10, uh, 10 and 12 through 14. And then Sklar goes on, stated differently, the atoning sacrifices of the Old Testament were pointers to a much greater atoning sacrifice to come, one that would be enough to cover the debt fully and finally. 
So uh, when Jesus is saying, if you, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent. So what Jesus is talking about here, and I'm, I'm going to go to a commentary here from R.T. France, where he, he says when, when Jesus is quoting actually from Hosea, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, uh, France points out that Hosea's underlining concern was the danger of a religion which is all external, where ritual demands have taken the place of love. In other words, Israel was offering sacrifices. They were doing, quote unquote, the right things on paper, but their hearts were far from God. So God wanted their hearts. He wanted their devotion. He wanted their commitment. And and just finally, when this question is framed from Robert on YouTube, when Jesus taught forgiveness will end our sins, why need sacrifice? Well, Jesus didn't just teach that, you know, we're just going to forgive you and there's no sacrifice necessary. In fact, as we talked about in last week's podcast, it was very clear from the words of Jesus in the upper room the night before he was betrayed that he did view his death as a sacrifice to God, as the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, which talks about the suffering suffering servant uh, that would come along and take the sins of the world upon himself. In the upper room, Jesus identified himself as that suffering servant. And then, of course, instituted the new covenant where Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And that is a reference back to that Old Testament sacrificial system. So I think that the grand themes that might answer this question from Robert is that Jesus God wants our hearts. He doesn't just want us to do X, Y, and Z, although those sacrifices were necessary. And as Jay Sklar points out, it's kind of like Israel writing a check and God accepts the check, forgives the sin, but he doesn't cash it yet. And that wouldn't happen fully until Jesus came and offered himself as that final sacrifice and instituting that new covenant in his blood. So I hope that's helpful uh, as an answer to that question from Robert. And without any further ado, very excited to get into the toxic war on masculinity. And here's Nancy Piercy. Well, Nancy, it's great to have you back on the podcast. As our listeners and viewers know, one of my favorite books is your book, Love Thy Body, which we just walked uh, through w- uh, with our our study group on Facebook. And you got to come on and we got to interview you, which was so fun. But you have a new book coming out that I'm very, very excited about. It's called The Toxic War on Masculinity. And the subtitle is How Christianity Reconciles the Sexes. And I have been so excited for this book to come out. I'd love to just have you talk a little bit about what led you to write this book. Is it sort of a part two to Love Thy Body? Or how do you see those things being connected? Yeah, it's it's interesting to me. I didn't think of it that way, but a lot of people have said that it seems almost like a partner, you know, two books that are correlating with one another. But actually, I started I I started writing uh, the Toxic One Masculinity. Uh, in a nutshell, I saw a problem and I saw a solution. <laughs> so the problem was I was actually pretty shocked at the level of hostility that it's become acceptable to express against men. Mm. I think the, the the headline that really caught my attention was the Washington Post had an article titled, Why Can't We Hate Men? Mm. And I thought, really? <laughs> In a mainstream, respected uh, newspaper like that, the Huffington Post edit, uh, had an editor who wrote, my New Year's resolution is to hate all men. Wow. And I, you can buy T-shirts now that say, so many men, so little ammunition. Mm. Uh, book titles have come out, I hate men, no good men, and are men necessary? So that was the, the beginning point. And then I saw that even men are jumping on the bandwagon. A uh, male author wrote a book in which he said, talking about healthy masculinity is like talking about healthy cancer. Mm. And this one came out uh, just recently. You may have seen it. So it's not in the book because it's just recent. But the director of the movie Avatar, uh, James Cameron, was in the news saying testosterone is a toxin that you have to work out of your system. Wow. So the first reason I wrote the book is I really wanted to understand where is this coming from? You cannot effectively stand against a social trend unless you know where it came from and how it developed. So a good bit of the book is just saying, where did this come from? It goes back much earlier than most people realize. And so kind of tracing the steps, uh, where how we got here. Mm. And, and so that was the problem. And, and then the solution 
was uh, I started reading sociological books on Christianity and finding out that Christian men are actually doing extremely well. Wow. And this is not something that's well known either. In fact, uh, let me let me read you. Um, yeah, let me read you a few quotes. It was easy to find quotes on the internet <laughs> saying mm. that you know any any concept of male authority or headship in the home leads to uh, chauvinistic, insensitive, tyrannical patriarchs. Wow. So here, and this listen to this one. It's from a Christian publication. It is no secret that abuse is prevalent in conservative churches that embrace headship theory. Or this was by the co-founder of the Church Two movement. The theology of male headship feeds the rape culture that we see permeating American Christianity today. And I read these and I thought, wait a minute, they're not paying attention to the social sciences. There's data coming out from the social sciences today that, that that shows that these accusations are just false. So the, the the sociologists and psychologists were reading these accusations and saying, well, where's your evidence? Where's your evidence? And so they started doing the studies. And they're, they're fairly recent. And so most Christians don't know about them. In fact, I had to go digging in the academic journals in order wow. to find them. But here's what they found. Compared to the average American family man, evangelical men are the most loving husbands and the most engaged fathers. Uh, on, on terms of their wives, by the way, they do interview the wives separately. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's important because the wives yeah. don't always, they won't always say what they really think. Um, but so what they're really saying is that their wives report being, uh, having the highest levels of happiness with the way they're husbands express love and appreciation. Evangelical men are the most engaged with their children, both in terms of shared activities like church youth group and sports, and in terms of discipline, like setting limits on screen time or enforcing bedtime. Evangelical couples are the least likely to divorce. And the, the real surprise was they actually have the lowest rates of domestic violence of any wow. any major group in America. So this is amazing. Even Christians don't know this. I, you know, I speak at Christian colleges and seminaries and schools, and people just sit back and their jaws drop. Like, yeah, well, because it goes, it really goes against the cultural narrative right now, especially as I've studied deconstruction in the deconstruction space. You would think that evangelicalism, or just, you know, however people want to define that, is just a blight on society that leads to all sorts of abuse. And of course, every instance of abuse is highlighted and magnified, as if there's not abuse in other movements as well. But that's that's a very interesting statistic that, that does really go against everything we're seeing as far as um, social media and the narrative that seems to be crafted by culture. Yes, in fact, let me give you a quote. Sometimes it's easier to have it really uh, crystallized. So my uh, my go-to sociologist, the one that I quote the most frequently, because he did the largest study on evangelicals, and uh, and he's considered perhaps the top marriage researcher in the nation. So he gets published in places like the New York Times and the Washington Post. And so this was in the New York Times. And he said, it turns out, that the happiest of all wives in America are religious conservatives. By the way, it, the reason they focus on the wives, of course, is that the assumption is that th these marriages are oppressive to the wives. Right. The happiest of all wives in America are religious, religious conservatives. Fully 73% of wives who hold conservative gender values and attend religious services regularly with their husbands have high quality marriages. So that uh, Brad Wilcox is at the University of Virginia, and this is this is something he got into the Washington Times of all places, and he actually ends by saying, uh, "Academics need to cast aside their prejudices." Of course, he's speaking to his own colleagues uh, at places like the University of Virginia. They need academics need to cast aside their prejudice about religious conservatives and evangelicals in particular. Hmm. Conservative Protestant married men with children are consistently the most active and expressive fathers and the most emotionally engaged husbands. Hmm. 
So this is this is empirical research. You know, this yeah. isn't just a pastor giving, you know, sort of trying to encourage you with yay raw yeah. sermons. <laughs> this right. is rigorously tested academic research, yeah. and it, it it's something that should make us feel confident in bringing this data out into the public square, bring it it into our churches, so that we can encourage Christian men uh, that that in spite of all the accusations coming from the culture. Uh, they actually are doing very well, and it shows up in rigorous academic testing. Wow. Uh, you know, it blows my mind that you brought up that quote from James Cameron, because I don't know if you saw the second Avatar movie, Avatar Way of Water, no. but of all, well, I had, you know, I have some criticisms. Of course, it's very pantheistic, and there's this sort of social justice narrative going on. But the one thing that I thought that movie really captured beautifully was the dynamic between what would I would call a healthy masculinity and a healthy femininity. There was a very strong focus on the family unit. The women were strong and capable, but they didn't act like like men. The men were the leaders who had tender hearts, but yet strength and led with, uh, you know, with um, tenderness and strength, which is, it, it still blows my mind that he would say that because I felt like he really captured that quite well in that movie. I'd love to know your opinion if you ever get a chance to see it, if you would agree with that. Of course, you know, Avatar was recorded, I think it's, it took him 12 years to finish the movie. So maybe the cultural narrative changed over time, which is highly possible. But I'm really fascinated by some of the data you just brought out, because it seems like all we've heard is the opposite, that Christians divorce at the same rate as uh, secular culture. And so, like, why don't we know this stuff? Why is this not more talked about or more out in the open? Exactly. The first pushback I always get when I talk about these numbers is, well, haven't we heard that Christians divorce at the same rate? And and by the way, in my research, I discovered that that's one of the most widely used statistics by Christian leaders. Apparently, they're trying to motivate us. But, but researchers went back to the data. And what they did is they divided out evangelical men who attend church regularly, who have a genuine commitment, you know, an authentic faith versus nominal Christians. Mm. So nominal Christians are men who, in a survey like this, might check the Baptist box, for example, but who actually attend church rarely, if at all. You know, they, they have the evangelical label, but they're not living it. And it turns out that these men are shockingly different. They are they have the worst marriages, their wives report the lowest level of happiness. Mm. They are the least engaged with their children. They have the highest rate of divorce, higher than secular men. And the the real shocker, they have the highest rate of domestic violence, higher mm. than even secular men. Wow. So this is it this is why the statistics get skewed. If you just look at evangelicals, which a lot of researchers have done. You'll you'll get you'll get the wrong numbers because you're putting together men who are better than secular men with men who are worse than secular mm, men. Interesting. And so if you put them together, you get the wrong number, and that's what's happened in in most of the studies up till now. It was it was Brad Wilcox, I think, who first teased this out, and so now we understand why it is that. So many people have a negative view of evangelicals. They probably run into some nominals because mm. nominal Christians, uh, the, the sh by sheer numbers, you and I probably hang out mostly with fairly committed Christian men. And so my first assumption was that the nominal Christian men would be a fairly small group. They're not. In America, because we've had a kind of cultural Christianity, mm -hmm. they're at least the same numbers. At least one of my studies had them coming out at the same number. And so you have a 50-50 chance that if you talk to somebody who claims an evangelical identity, that he is, in fact, a nominal Christian. And what they do is they hang around the fringes of the Christian world enough to pick up the language of wow. headship and submission, but they infuse it with secular meanings. So entitlement, dominance, control. Um, and, the, and people have asked me, like, but why would they be worse? than secular men. Well, because they have, they're using religious language. And so in a sense, they, f they feel like they're getting religious permission to do, uh, to, to live the way they're living. Whereas a secular person doesn't, doesn't have that. So they end up actually having the worst of both worlds. 
they're, they feel in a sense a uh, religious justification, but for living by a secular script. Mm, that's that's really fascinating. I want to talk about the word masculinity a little bit because you've identified there are two scripts really that that we're operating from. Because when I think of the word masculinity, uh, I think of a pr- protection, a man who uses his physical strength to protect those in his care, or someone who um, you know takes initiative to lead his family well. But then there's other ideas that people might think of of dom- you know being domineering or oppressive to the people in. In his care. So what are the two scripts that we're working from and what effect have those had? Yeah, I, I found that this was really helpful. It comes out of a, a study done by a sociologist. And I'll, I'll give you a little background on this. The reason it is helpful is um, uh, people, uh, this has been the most controversial book I've written. Uh, I, I really thought Love Thy Body would be more controversial yeah. because it deals with issues like abortion, homosexuality and transgenderism, right. which are really on the cutting edge today. Um, but I have actually found this one to be more controversial. I taught some classes on the manuscript and I led reading groups on the manuscript. And when they would tell their friends and family uh, what the book was about, invariably, the first question was, whose side is she on? Mm. You know, with that tone, you know, whose side is she on? And the assumption is that you have to either be you know, completely against masculinity, you know, you're some sort of male bashing feminist, <laughs> Or you have to be some angry reactionary, you know, who's defending men. And so I put this study right at the beginning of the book to sort of uh, defuse that hostility and, uh, and, and say, you know, it's not either for or against. And this was an a, a ingenious experiment that was done by a sociologist. He's very well known. He's not a Christian. Um, he's well known. And so he gets invited to speak all around the world. Yes. And so he decided to ask young men two questions. He said, what does it mean to be a good man? If you're at a funeral and in the eulogy, they say he was a good man. Mm. What does that mean? All around the world, young men had no problem answering that, you know, from Australia to Germany to Brazil. Uh, and I'll read you it. Uh, the, the, so you get the actual words. Uh, uh, honor, duty, integrity, sacrifice, do the right thing, stand up for the little guy, be a provider, be a protector, be responsible. And the sociologists would say, well, where'd you learn that? And they would say, it's just in the air we breathe. Or if they were um, in the West, in a Western culture, they would say, it's our Judeo-Christian heritage. Hmm. And then he would follow up with a second question. He'd say, well, what does it mean if I say to you, man up, be a real man? And the young man would say, oh, no, 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 that's completely different. And again, I'll read you their words. That means be tough, strong, never show weakness, win at all costs, suck it up, be competitive, get rich, get laid. Hmm. So in other words, there are two competing scripts out there for masculinity. And most men, men are made in God's image. And they do know what it means to be the good man. They do know what it but their unique strengths were not given them just to do whatever they want, but to provide and protect, as you were saying, and, and if necessary, even fight for the people that they love. But they also are being pressured by a culture to adopt, you know, the real man, you know, so the good man versus the real man. And, and so what I say in the book is the debate is not really so much between men and women, but within men's own heads between these two scripts. And it gives us a better way, a better strategy, I think, for dealing with these issues because uh, because men don't respond well to being called toxic. Yeah. <laughs> and, and none of us would. So the strategy is how can we support men, encourage them, affirm them, and what they already know is the good man. I mean, Romans 2, right? We all have a conscience. We all know what's right and wrong. How can we encourage them in being the good men, which they innately know all around the world? And, and, and then, you know, instead of trying to denounce them for the real man, encourage and support them in being the good man. So I think that that gives us a much more positive approach to these issues. 
Well, I want to take a moment and let you know about our first sponsor today. That's Good Ranchers. You all know I love Good Ranchers. It's American meat delivered right to your door. But guys, this isn't just any meat. This is high quality, antibiotic free, hormone free meat that's all grown, raised, harvested right here in America. I love the better than organic chicken, which by the way is triple trimmed, which means you have to do nothing to it. When you pull it out of your freezer, thaw it out, and then make whatever meal you're going to make. I just love the convenience of having such high quality meat. Uh, so go to GoodRanchers.com. Use my code ALISA for $30 off your first box. Guys, this is a great Father's Day gift idea. You know, it's getting into grill season. We're coming into the summertime. Everybody's looking to see what do you want to throw on your grill. They've got amazing ribeye steaks, flat iron steaks, chicken, uh, bacon. Oh, the bacon. You guys, the bacon is honestly, without exaggeration, the best bacon I've ever had. So go to GoodRanchers.com. Use the code ALISA for $30 off your first box. You will lock in your price for two years. That means your price will not go up. I wish that I could pay today what I paid for my groceries two years ago. Well, two years from now, you can be saying that, that your price for your meat has not gone up. So again, GoodRanchers.com. Use the code ALISA for $30 off your first box. I love your title because you've sort of flipped the toxic masculinity idea on its head with the toxic war on masculinity. But anywhere in culture that you look, and I'm, I'm curious to know, maybe I'll ask you this toward the end about the pushback you've received on the book, but I can already imagine, you know, people act like if you, if you come around saying that men are under attack or that there's a war on masculinity or something like that, they will almost just respond with mockery, like, oh yeah, men, they just can't get a break, you know, poor men, as if men have been these uh, oppressors who have had all the privilege. But as, I mean, if we're just going with the data, uh, men are falling behind in education, employment, employment, health, and even life expectancy, as you point out. And so why do you think that pe people sort of punt to that mocking thing, like, yeah, men are fine, they've been fine, we need to give somebody else some attention. But why are people ignoring these real problems? Because the way I see it, if we don't teach men how to be good men, then that's a, that, that leads to a very dangerous society. Yes, this is something that's really surprised me. Here's how one of my students put it. She said, we always hear about the problems women face, like sexual harassment and discrimination and so on. And so we assume that men are doing fine. And in reading my manuscript, she said, hey, actually, men are not doing fine. Yes, it's true that the CEOs, you know, the, maybe the top 5 to 10 percent of men are at the, at the very top. But on average, men are actually falling behind. And so it, in my book, I do talk about men, boys falling behind at all levels of education, from kindergarten through college. I mean, we face this at Houston Christian University. The average university now is 60% women and 40% men. And some of them are even 70, 30. Wow. Um, there was even an article on how some of the top universities are doing sort of reverse, uh, reverse affirmative action to try to attract more men. Um, there are books coming out with titles like you know, why, The Trouble with Boys and The Boy Crisis and Why, Boy, why Boys Fail. M more women than men are going to graduate school. More women than men are even going to professional school like law and medicine. And, and as adults, men are falling behind as well in terms of uh, more men than women commit suicide. More men are likely to be addicted to drugs and alcohol. More men are victims of violence and per perpetrators of violence. I used to work for a prison fellowship, which is an international ministry. And we knew that 90% of people sitting behind bars are male. Are male. Um, and recently, men have been falling out of the workplace as well. Uh, uh, unemployment among men is at depression era levels. Mm. It's not showing up in the statistics because they're no longer even looking for work. So you have, this is researchers who dug behind the statistics and they say that male unemployment is at depression era levels and their life expectancy, as you mentioned, is even going, is even going down. Now, women's have stayed the same. So it's not a general trend. It's only men's life expectancy that has gone down in recent years. And so I think it is about time that we think about how we can help 
men and boys, how we can support them better. Christina Hoff Summers is a philosopher who wrote maybe the first book on the, su- the subject. Yeah. It was called The War Against Boys. And she says the main reason we cannot get started with programs for boys and men is that feminist groups tend to oppose them. You know, feminist groups have poured lots and lots of money and effort into helping women succeed and helping girls succeed in school, creating girl-friendly curriculum and so on, which is great. You know, it's great that girls are moving ahead. You, you have to realize that women weren't even allowed into universities until about the mid 20th century. So it's very recent and that's good. So we don't want to denigrate that, but we do need to say we, we need some programs now for boys. We need to have some compassion on the fact that our boys are falling behind. Mm. And you point out that the criticism, criticisms of men uh, b- began much earlier than most of us think. So walk us through a little bit of that history. Where did, where did we, how did we get here? And where did this term toxic masculinity even come from? Yes. So I think a lot of people assume that it's a, a product of uh, uh, second wave feminism in the 1960s. Actually, it started much earlier than that. It started with the Industrial Revolution. Think about before the Industrial Revolution, men worked side by side with their wives and children all day in, on the family farm, in the family industry, the family business. And so the ethos, the expectation of masculinity was very much a caretaking role. You know, they're responsible for their family and they need to be gentle and kind because they're dealing with their family members. And they were expected not only to be fathers of their family, but a common phrase back then was fathers of the community. They were supposed to bring that that fathering ethos, that caretaking ethos into the community as well. And authority had a very specific meaning back then. I think a lot of times we kind of think authority means, you know, I have the right to do what I want. But back then it was very clearly defined as the person responsible for the common good. So, you know, you naturally look out for what's good for you. I look out for what's good for me. But who looks out for the common good, whether it's the common good of the marriage relationship or the family, the church, civil society, and so on? Positions of authority were supposed to be, the word back then was disinterested, meaning not pursuing your own interest, but pursuing the interest of the whole. So there were very stringent expectations on men back then. How did this all change? It started with the Industrial Revolution. It took work out of the home, which meant, of course, men had to follow their work out of the home into factories and offices. And for the first time in American history, men were not working alongside their wives and children. And they were working as individuals in competition with other men. And already back then, you start to see people complaining that men were changing. They were no longer sort of acting out a caretaking ethos. They were acting out, look out for number one, be competitive, be aggressive, be egocentric, be self-interested. And and the literature of the time, you see protests. You know, it started out as a protest that men were losing the, the, the caretaking ethos that they had in the colonial era. And so uh, in, in my book, The Toxic War and Masculinity, I do take people through several stages. It took, you know, several stages to reach the point where we are today. But that was the starting point. That's when Mm -hmm. you first start seeing the language shift and become very critical of the male character. What do you think uh, culture would say in your research would be a healthy version of masculinity? Or do they think there even is one? What, What does culture say is a healthy man? Well, the cool thing about the, going back to American history is that the colonial era was very Christian. And so in a sense, you're not just being speculative. You can say, well, this is what it looked like, you know, when it was, when it was actually lived out. And so, for example, I deal with Puritans. I literally have students say, I have never heard anything positive about the Puritans. <laughs> <laughs> so they're very surprised when I I have quotes from the Puritans showing that they had very loving families, very affectionate marriages. In fact, the Puritans passed the first law anywhere in the entire world against wife beating. 1644. Wow. <laughs> wow. 
they passed the first that. law. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. It was they passed the first law against wife beating and it was soon amended to include wives beating husbands and <laughs> and beating your slaves and children as well. But it started out as the first law anywhere against wife beating. So it we're not just speculative. We can show that what Christianity looked like when it was lived out in the colonial era. Wow. And so this is helpful. It kind of sets up a baseline that you can see how what happened as society became more secular as they lost that Christian vision. And and this is actually the, the, this, this part of the Industrial Revolution as well, because as the as work was taken out of home, out of the home and there were huge factories and industry and financial institutions and banks and universities and the state, of course, government a huge public sphere developed and people began to say, well, this public sphere should be run by scientific principles and by which they meant value free, by which they meant don't bring your private values into the public sphere, which is of course what we still hear today, mm -hmm. but that's where it began. And so because men were the ones who were out in the public sphere at that time, you know, going through public education, which was secular, working in a secular environment, the biblical ethic lost its hold on men's hearts earlier than it did. You know, they became secularized earlier than women did. And so again, there was a tension there as women began to complain <laughs> that their men were no longer these moral, upright characters that they used to be. And in fact, this is why there were so many reform movements in the 19th century, because men's behavior got worse. Mm. Uh, in the 19th century, there was a huge increase in crime, in, dr in drinking, gambling, prostitution. There was, the number of brothels mushroomed. Uh, sometimes it's easier if you have a single fact to mm -hmm. hang, the, hang your ideas on. In 1830, Americans drank three times as much as they do today. Wow. The alcoholism peaked in the 19th century. Wow. So there's a reason there was a temperance movement, <laughs> because men were spending all their money on drink and leaving their families destitute and then coming home and beating their wives because they were drunk. I mean, this is I'm talking about wow. what people were saying at the time. Yeah. Um, there was there's a reason that there was an abolition movement. Um, there was a there was a reason that there were movements against prostitution and sex trafficking. There was a huge growth in reform movements at the time, but most of them run by women, by the way. You know, the, the history books don't always tell you that, but yeah. these reform movements were largely driven by women. Uh, for example, the temperance movement was mostly women trying to bring their husbands out of the saloons and taverns and back to the family hearth where they belonged. You know, so, so there was a sexual tension in mm. many of these movements because it was women saying, guys, you need to uh, come back to your Christian values, as we would put it today, maybe. Um, and, and this was also driven by the fact that, you know, if the, if the public sphere is supposed to be value free, where do we cultivate values? You know, people desperately wanted to keep values like love, relationship, altruism, religious piety, and so on. Well, those had to be cultivated in the home presided over by women. And so in the 19th century, for the first time, again, first time ever in human history, women were said to be morally and spiritually superior to men. Sort of the, the double standard that we still see today. All the way back to the ancient Greeks and Romans, people had thought that men were morally superior, mm. that the insight between right and wrong was a rational insight, and they thought men were more rational. And therefore, they said men are more moral. They're morally stronger. They're more able to keep their you know, animal impulses in check. So this was a huge reversal. In the 19th century, people began to say uh, women are morally you know, more pure. Um, men are more naturally prone to, to, to sin and vice, uh, especially in, in regard to things like sex and alcohol. And so a lot of the tension between the sexes goes back to that period where women felt like it was their job to hold husbands in check. And men were, in a sense, I have one uh, secular historian who puts it this way. It said society was kind of letting men off the hook. Mm. 
you know, it was no longer expecting moral leadership from men. It was expecting women to, in a sense, tame men. And yeah. I don't know about you, Alyssa, but um, I have talked to some young people who say they think it's the same today. I was on a podcast with a young couple. That it's, it's, it was a podcast to young people. And um, the young man, the husband said, oh, yeah, in Christian circles, it's just thought that you know men are just naturally much more prone to sin and temptation, especially sexual temptation, and that it's women who need to hold the line and women who have to make sure that they they uh, impose you know biblical morality on their husbands. And if they don't do their responsibility, then it's their fault if their men are doing porn or having affairs. And I've heard from a lot of people that that's still the the uh, narrative in Christian circles. Anyway, so it starts in the 19th century. So to really understand it, we have to go back and say, where did this come from? So that we can deal with it more effectively today. Mm, that That is so fascinating. And I'm just thinking about media too, because it seems to me that there are trends to uh, portray women as almost like toxic masculine men in a way. You have women fist fighting men, you have women acting like men, cussing, you know, sort of that stereotype. In, I think in a way they're maybe trying to break the stereotype by saying, no, women can be just as sinful as men too. And so there's that trend. But then you also have this trend that, as you've pointed out, portraying men as the the villains. Men are, are always the ones that are going to oppress somebody or abuse somebody. And yet, at the same time, you have movies come out that portray men doing really heroic things. And those sell tickets too. So there's like all these mixed messages. But where did where did we get this stereotype of men being the villain and women being the victims, even though it seems to contradict some of the narrative that we even see in movies? Yeah. Well, movies have to sell. And so they yeah. can't, always, they can't always portray men as a villain or they won't sell. Right. <laughs> um, but <laughs> In, in in my book, The Toxic Born Masculinity, I go through several stages. And the one I've, I'd like to focus on, the one a lot of people jump on, is the impact of Darwinism. Mm. So this would be, you know, 1859, Darwin publishes uh, The Origin of Species. And that really contributed to a negative view of masculinity. Because Darwinian writers began to say, that in the struggle for survival, the men who came out on top were rugged, ruthless, brutal, savage, barbarian, and even predatory. Oh. And so this well, and this is when books came out like the Tarzan series, right? So the idea was that Tarzan was raised by the apes, and therefore, you know, he still had that animal nature within him. And even after he becomes you know, civilized and, and learns European manners, in the book, he literally says to Jane, I am still a wild beast at heart. And, and there were more serious literature, too. It's called uh, literary naturalism. The best known is Jack London. So mm -hmm. Jack London uh, read Darwinian books when he was young and had what one historian calls a conversion experience to radical materialism, naturalism. And so he wrote about dogs, but his, you know, they were metaphors for, for people. And his point was that we are all products of evolution and uh, environment and genes in the struggle for existence. And so how did this affect the prevailing views of masculinity? Well, Christianity had urged men to live up to the image of God in them. Whereas Darwinian thinkers began to reverse that and say, no, no, our true self is the animal nature. Mm. And the you know the beast within as Darwin put it, um, and there's only a thin veneer of civilization. That was one of their favorite phrases. There's mm. a thin veneer of civilization, but you know men are always about to break through. And so uh, w one of the, um, the the most the most uh, popular the most <laughs> the most effective popularizer of Darwinism here in America was Herbert Spencer, and he literally said the men who gave rise to our modern men, you know, were these harsh, brutal men. And you say, well, how did women get along with them then? And he says, well, they had to learn the ability to please. And it would also help if they learned to hide their resentment at poor treatment. Mm. So that apparently was the message of evolution. You know, men are wow. brutal beasts and 
women need to put up with it. And Darwin himself, by the way, also argued that women are inferior. They're intellectually inferior. Um, he acknowledged that women are more sensitive and intuitive. But then he said, but those are characteristics of the lower species. Mm -hmm. So even women's strengths were signs of their inferiority. Right. So it was Darwinism contributed a great deal to the secular script for masculinity that uh, portrayed men as crude, lewd, rude, and crude, uh, governed by the biological instincts of lust and power. So I, I traced several stages of you know how the masculine script became so negative and acquired what we now call toxic traits. And Darwinian evolution was a big part of it. Wow, that's really fascinating. And, you know, with the time we have left, I'd love to swing more into the practical realm because it seems like the best long-term solution for this is for men to disciple their sons, to be good examples and involve them in teaching them what masculinity is really all about. Um, but at the same time, when you watch sitcoms, you watch some of the media that's out there, it's as if almost every time you have a fight, I'm thinking of what's that old sitcom, everybody, was it called Everybody Loves Ray? It was Ray Romano, where he's just this bumbling idiot the whole time. And, oh, especially in kids programming, well, I would even argue it's both parents that are really portrayed as bumbling idiots, but especially the fathers. And so kids are kind of being conditioned by the media that they're taking in to see their parents as like, Ugh, they're just kind of idiots. They don't know anything, especially dad. He's just always getting everything wrong and he can't make anybody happy or do anything right. Um, so where did that negative image come from? And when did do you think that started in culture? Yeah, first of all, I agree with you that the most important long-term strategy is to reconnect fathers with their sons because everyone knows on both sides of the political aisle, you know, left and right. This used to be a right issue, by the way, and now it's left and right. Mm. Uh, that, that fatherless boys do have greater problems in school, yeah. more likely to drop out of school, more likely to have behavioral problems, more likely to do, uh, get addicted to sex and get addicted to drugs and alcohol, have sex outside of marriage, et cetera, et cetera. And we end up behind bars, by the way. Some 75, 80% of violent criminals are fatherless you know, we're fatherless boys. So it, it's really a serious thing that fathers are mocked and ridiculed in the media. One psychiatrist put it this way, we're not going to have a better class of men until we have a better class of fathers. Mm. I thought that was a good summary. So where did this ridicule of fathers begin? Again, you have to go back to the Industrial Revolution, because as fathers were taken out of the home, they began to be out of touch with what was happening in the home. Mm -hmm. They began to be out of touch with the family dynamics. They no longer knew their children as well. They no longer knew their kids' day-to-day -day activities and their, their feelings, their experiences, their needs. And so already in the 19th century, you see people protesting that our fathers are out of touch with our families. They are becoming irrelevant and incompetent, You know, because if you don't know your kids, you're gonna be incompetent. You won't really know what they need. And already that negative image starts in the 19th century. And people began to say, well, you know, uh, I'll actually give you a quote. The, the leading psychologist of the day said, never in American history has the American boy been so wild because he's been unsupervised by his father, mm. been so wild and so half orphaned. I love that phrase, wow. half orphaned because his father's not there in the way he used to be. And and the psychologist said, you know, boys, boys are being raised by females, you know, in the home, in the school, in the church. And because fathers weren't there, boys did have a lot of unsupervised time. And that's why the psychologist said they're becoming wild. You know, boys will be boys. That phrase was not used before that. Before wow. that, it was, it was expected that boys would be as good as girls. There was wow. no expectation that boys were particularly wild and unruly and rebellious and rambunctious. <laughs> that came about because the fathers were out of the home and boys were no longer being adequately parented. I mean, mothers tried to step in, but boys could see that the mother's life was quite different from the father's life. And so to follow the mother's rules seemed to, be, seemed to mean be effeminate. And so, of course, no boy's going to do that. Yeah. Even in the, in the literature of the time, you can see it. Up until now, literature for children was very didactic. 
you know, teaching, teaching children how to be good with positive role models. And now a new genre emerged that was actually called bad boy books because it was the first time that the bad boy was the protagonist. In fact, wow. the first the first one, the first uh, book of its kind was called The Story of a Bad Boy. And the best known, though, you probably you can probably guess Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. Oh, yeah. And Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, was deliberately parodying the earlier books because the earlier books were didactic and moralistic. And he was deliberately parodying them. So what happened when these boys grew up? They brought that concept, you know, if, if they thought the real boy now is the boy who's rambunctious and rule breaking and rowdy, they brought that with them into adulthood. Mm -hmm. And especially boys who were coming in from the countryside to find work in the city, they were leaving behind uh, structures of accountability, like family and church and mm -hmm. village. And so they were falling prey to the vices that were more common in the city. And again, we're back to the you know, great increase in crime and prostitution and so on. That was another reason for that, because boys were not being adequately parented by their fathers anymore. Wow. So all of that to say, these the problem with men being disconnected from their children and therefore being portrayed as incompetent parents, incompetent fathers, um, goes back to the Industrial Revolution as well. And what would be some practical steps fathers could take to disciple their sons well, to connect with their sons? And I would assume daughters, too, because it kind of the whole family together is what's going to lead to a really healthy expression of both genders. So what would be some just practical things for any fathers who might be listening to this today that they can take to reconnect with their sons and maybe just start instituting some practical steps to disciple them better in these areas? Right. You can't write a you can't write a book like this without giving some practical uh, tips. Um, even today in surveys, men say that the main barrier to having close relationship with their children is work, just like it has been ever since the Industrial Revolution. And so I do have a whole chapter on ways in which we could flex the work structure to some degree for both parents so that parents can be more involved with their kids. And at this point, it's mostly anecdotal, but I have lots of anecdotes of people who found ways to work from home two days a week, for mm. example, or I mean, some of them actually start home businesses or you know, start consulting businesses. Um, some of them uh, just leave work early. I have, I have one uh, student who would just leave work early two days a week to uh, coach his son's uh, basketball and soccer team. And his, co uh, his boss accused him of coasting, <laughs> but he said, it never actually hurt my career. And when my sons wow. got older, they said, we want to be a dad like you, which yeah. is a lot better than any workplace success. Yeah. I, have a, I have a story of one, another student. Um, sometimes it's, it's easier to have concrete anecdotes. So during the pandemic, the pandemic has a very slight silver lining <laughs> in, <laughs> in that Parents are saying, hey, I actually did get closer to my kids. Um, one study found that 65% of fathers said they don't want to go back to work full time because they, their family benefited so much from having at least working some of the time from home. And that, that statistic is in the book. Then there was another one that's come out more recently, so it's not in the book, but I love it. The New York Times had a headline that said, during the pandemic, Fathers got closer to their children, and they don't want to lose that. Mm. <laughs> that the New York Times says this. Oh, wonderful. So one of my students, uh, her her husband is a IT worker, and he came home during the pandemic. And because he was home, he was able to be more involved in the homeschooling. He was he decided he would be the one to make lunch every day. He was able to drive the kids to their soccer practice, and. He took on so much of the family responsibilities that his wife was freed up to start a, a, a part-time business. Uh, she's she's an opera singer. <laughs> I had a student who was an opera singer. Wow! Um, but she, <laughs> I know, pretty cool. She um, started a voice studio, and so the whole family is benefiting from the added income. And I interviewed her husband, and he said, "Our family life is so much more balanced now. I am never mm -hmm. going back to a cubicle." <laughs> And the final kicker was, he said, the time I used to spend commuting to work 
I now spend praying every morning with my wife. Wow. Wow. So I, I just give anecdotes like that to try to encourage men to see if there's ways that they can flex their work schedule. And, and really, the pandemic helped. I quote some CEOs who said, we never wanted to experiment with home-based work before because we were, we were afraid people would just slough off. You know, they would, they would be slouches. And yeah. he said, the pandemic completely exploded that. We did not lose any productivity. And in fact, if anything, they work more <laughs> when they're home because they're no wow. longer wasting time with the commute. They're no longer having to waste time, you know, with special work clothes and so on. He said, if anything, we have to tell them to stop. <laughs> they tend to, I don't know if you've ever worked from home, but yes, you you tend to keep going. Yeah. Um, <laughs> people I interviewed who, who work from home said, my biggest problem was knowing when to stop. So they did not lose any productivity. And so it actually is better, even f- for the workplace. You know, we have to sell it to the workplace. That's not only good for the family, which it is. But it's also good for the workplace that yeah. people who have good work, people who have good family relationships are better employers and yeah. are better employees. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned that that was one of the silver linings of the pandemic. I think also a silver lining was opening up people's minds to the possibility of homeschool, because that certainly was the case in our family, which has led us to being closer as a family. And I didn't see this coming, but my husband almost all by himself homeschooled our son, whereas my daughter worked a little bit more independently and I, I would work with her on a few things here and there. He he just kind of took the reins of my son's homeschool, and that has brought them closer together, and it's just been so great for our family. So I think there were some silver linings there with people, and also there's silver linings to all of the social media and the internet that we have, although there's a lot of bad stuff on there. It also has opened up people's minds, I think, to alternative ways of working and even business opportunities that wouldn't exist without an online space or something like that. So I love that. That's so practical because that's something all of us can be thinking through. Uh, as far as how to get more of that family time. I personally, just in the last year, have probably thought more about and invested more in homemaking than I ever have before. Just just enjoying that, you know, at any time that I have to cook meals and to make the home more inviting and and warm for the family. And um, so I think that there's just little things we can all do to um, really invest in the family and in in that time and, and just nurturing those times together that fathers and sons can have and fathers and daughters and all of that working together um, for society and for a better society. Um, But I do want to address one thing, because at the beginning, you mentioned how a lot of more progressive leaning types have connected headship and male led families with abuse or, you know, patriarchy, and they connect that with abuse. And, And certainly some of those charges, I think, are probably unfair because it would be perceived that even having a male led home is abusive in nature. But at the same time, there are there is a problem of abuse in homes. There's a problem. There's problems of abuse in churches, and I I do want to address that because you address the problem in your book of abuse in Christian homes. So how do you think churches can respond more effectively than maybe they have in the past? I think we've seen instances where maybe churches didn't know what to do or they didn't realize what was actually required of them. What advice would you give to churches to respond to that type of abuse more effectively? Right, as I mentioned earlier nominal Christian men actually have higher levels of domestic violence than even secular couples. And so I had to address that in the book. Otherwise, it would look like I was, you know, sweeping it under the carpet. Yeah. So I do have two chapters at the end on domestic abuse. And um, and I I have to tell you, the literature on the subject has really changed just in recent years, because until very recently, uh, the emphasis was all put on the wife. The emphasis was all on, well, if you would just love more, if you would just forgive more, if you would just make his favorite foods, if you would have had sex more often, if you would lose weight, if you would work on your appearance, then he will blossom into the man you want him to be. Mm. That's actually a direct quote from a woman who was being abused. Her oh. church kept telling her, you know, if you would just die to yourself more, mm. um, love more unconditionally. Well, he never did. And the reason is bullies you know, two bullies, truly abusive people do not respond well when you're kind to them. They interpret kindness as weakness. They interpret forgiveness as permission to keep abusing. Mm. 
They're like, mm-hmm. okay, you, I guess you're okay with this. <laughs> you know, um, it's kind of like the bully on the playground. You know, if you acquiesce, he gets worse. Or even international affairs, if there's a belligerent nation, as we have no, if you acquiesce, if you appease, they get worse. So you just recently you are starting to see change in the books that are being written on domestic abuse, which is very good, um, because they're they're addressing much more the the need to confront Matthew 18. Matthew 18, I just keep coming back to that. Matthew 18 is the verse on what you do if somebody's sinning against you. And for a long time, for some reason, this verse was not applied to marriage. Mm. But if a husband is truly sinning, of course, a wife as well, but some 80% or whatever, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but some 80% of abuse is uh, from the, the, the male, the husband. Um, Matthew 18 is the verse on how to deal with someone who's sinning against you. And I deal with a lot of data again. This is the most fact, fact-driven fact book that I have written. So you know, the facts from the sociology and the facts of history. And here, the facts on people who've done uh, studies, psychologists mostly, who've done studies of abusive marriages. And my my the best known is John Gottman. So he's not a Christian, but he's... Um, He's a former mathematician, and so he brought that very empirical, quantifiable approach to marriage, uh, which nobody had done before. And he became, he, what he does is he has a, a love lab. He calls it his love lab. It's, it's like a um, bed and breakfast, and a couple comes in and stays up to maybe 72 hours, and they're wired up to find out you know, how, how, the heart rate, how fast is that beating, and there's the, the, how much are they sweating, and... Their, their, their breathing rate and so on, uh, you know, how much, and even their urine is tested for uh, stress hormones. And they have an elaborate system of uh, coding behavior, you know, everything from smiling to rolling your eyes in disgust, and, and for also coding language, everything from put downs to placating. And they feed all of this into a computer. And he became famous because he was able to predict with. 93.6 accuracy whether a couple would divorce or not. Wow. And even how soon, you know, uh, and this was like with 15 minutes of observation on a very short time scale, he could see this. And, you know, okay, this couple's going to last seven years, this couple's going to last 12 years. And so a lot of, obviously, a lot of Christians are working, you know, tuning into his data. The most surprising thing he found was. The health of a marriage depends primarily on the husband. Hmm. That 65% of men in America do not respect their wives, do not, or his language is, they do not accept influence from their wives, by which he means they they don't listen to their wives' concerns, their wives' opinions, their their wives, uh, they, they don't involve wives in the decision making. And of course, women then feel very disrespected. And he said, in those cases where a husband does not listen to his wife's voice, they have an 81% chance of breaking up, you know, either oh. divorce or settling into long-term unhappiness. Um, and his point is that it is mostly women who work on the relationship. It's mostly women who read books on marriage, who go to marriage counselors, who go to pastoral counseling about their about their marriage. And so he said the main uh, thing that matters is whether the husband responds. Mm. And he says, unfortunately, in most cases, they don't. They don't return the favor, as he puts it. And in one of his books, he actually turns directly to the men. And he says, you know, his point is not to shame or blame men. He says, my point is to give men the sense of how much power they have, that they actually can fix their marriage. You know, the data shows this very clearly, that if a man decides to sh- share decision-making with his wife, It's going to work in the majority of cases. So he turns to Ben and he says, what I want you to realize is how much power you really have. Mm. If you want a good marriage, it's up to you. By a wide margin, that's his uh, actual words, that the man by a wide margin is the one who determines whether you have a good marriage or not. Wow. So most of us don't realize that. That's more data that the Christian world needs to know about because The data is putting the emphasis right where the scripture does. (laughs) Who is supposed to take the initiative? 
all the way back to Genesis 1. Who's supposed to leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife? You know, who's supposed to take the initiative to leave his childhood and create a new life with his wife? It's, it's the husband. So I think the data is supporting what is essentially a biblical view of marriage. Yeah, that's good. Well, the book comes out, it uh, looks like June 27th, right? So that's mm-hmm. coming soon. Tell everyone how they can connect with you, where they can pre-order the book, and any information you want them to know. Uh, definitely want to recommend everybody picks up this book because there's just uh, such great information in here. And so, Nancy, where can they connect with you and pre-order the book? Well, of course, you can pre-order anywhere. Uh, Amazon is more strategic because Amazon sets the tone, unfortunately. Um, mm-hmm. But And pre-orders do help. They do help with algorithms. If you pre-order, then ultimately Amazon gives it more more coverage. So that's a good thing. But if the, my, my publisher has helped me re, redo my whole website. So go look at it, nancypiercy.com. Um, it's, it's colorful and fun now, and it, it didn't used to be. So go look at nancypiercy.com. And of course, you can order from from there as well. And you can take a look at my other books if you're not familiar with them as well. Awesome. Well, I want to thank my guest, uh, Professor Nancy Piercy, for joining us for this great conversation today. Guys, I just want to add to when when you order this book, especially on Amazon, when it comes out on July, uh, sorry, June 27th, go back to Amazon and leave a review. I can't tell you how much that helps authors when you go back to Amazon and you leave a review, get a bunch of good reviews going, and that helps with algorithms. As, as Professor Nancy mentioned, it helps uh, give it more coverage, get it into the news feeds of more people. It puts it in the suggested categories. So that really helps authors if you pre-order. Then when you go back when the book comes out and leave a review. Um, I will also want to mention our sponsor. Southern Evangelical Seminary, where I am currently a student. If you are looking for higher level education, I recommend SES. Go to ses.edu slash Elisa, and you can download a free ebook and take a look around the website and what they have to offer. I'll be taking classes again in the fall. Very, very excited about that. And for now, as we pursue Christ, let's remember to keep a sharp mind, a soft heart, and a thick skin. Mm-hmm.